We're here to talk about Afghanistan. I'm John Blacksland. I'm a senior fellow at the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre at the Australian National University. I'm uh, here with uh, Professor Daniel Marston, who's a professor of military studies at uh, the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre. He's also the military studies coordinator at the Australian Command and Staff College at Western Creek. He's formerly a visiting fellow at Oxford University, and he was a professor at uh, the United States uh, Army Command and General Staff College in Leavenworth in uh, Kansas. With us also, uh, he, I should say, he was an advisor to the uh, United States uh, Army, as well as the British, Canadian and Australian uh, senior officers in Iraq and Afghanistan over the last few years. Very much uh, a man with a lot of knowledge to share with us today. We also have uh, Captain uh, Paul Lashenko. Uh, Captain Lashenko is uh, He's done a Master of Arts in International Relations here at the Australian National University, and he's also completed a Master of International Relations at the Australian Pacific, uh, Asia Pacific College of Diplomacy, and he has got high honours in both degrees. He's a particularly accomplished officer uh, in the US Army. He is uh, a man with experience on operations in Afghanistan and Iraq. Gentlemen, what we're going to do just to bring us up to speed is to reflect briefly on where we've been in the last uh, 11 or so years since mm. the war on the so-called war on terror commenced. Mm. We know that uh, Prime Minister John Howard at the time was in Washington when 9-11 happened. That very much affected him personally. Uh, he invoked the ANZUS Treaty for the, for the first time uh, and committed Australian forces to work alongside the United States and other allies in addressing the, the issues. Um, of course, very shortly after that, Australian troops are committed alongside US troops in Afghanistan, special forces initially. Three rotations of special forces go in in late, Octo uh, late uh, October 2001. They're there till the end of 2002. Uh, and then we pull out, dust our hands, thinking that's it. No more of Afghanistan, thank you very much. Um, no more of that dust in my jowls. Um, and uh, thinking about other things. And of course, Iraq happens and we're not going to deal with Iraq today. But a few years later, in 2005, Australian troops are back in uh, are back in Afghanistan, and we're back in with the special forces leading. The sense is that the situation there is uh, so it's degenerated so so much that we need special forces, given their prowess, their uh, proficiency, mm. their accuracy, their reliability, and most importantly, the prospect of very few casualties, own casualties, which is a very important political factor in terms mm. of the domestic political equation in Australia. Mm. They get chosen to deploy and uh, set the path for what happens the next year in 2006 when we commit a reconstruction task force, the RTF of engineers primarily, mm. to work alongside the Dutch. Uh, we do it in a province called Uruzgan, which is in the Regional Command South area, so it's in the Pashtun belt. But it's, it's not the main province. It's an important one, but not the pivotal one. So it's a bit like our commitment to the Vietnam War, where we take on a province called Phuc Duy, not far from Saigon in the south, uh, an important province, but not the most important province. So it's an area where Australia could make a contribution, but not, not overcommit itself. So it, so it, it seemed at the time. Mm. In this, this time around in Afghanistan, our commitment has been much more calibrated, carefully measured to make sure that we don't overcommit, we don't reap the, the political consequences of excessive casualties uh, that had such a corrosive effect domestically in terms of the politics in Australia. There's a keen e a, a, a desire to avoid that mm. on both sides of politics in Australia, understandable. So in 2006, we go in uh, to Aruzgan and we do it with the Dutch. We don't do it with the Canadians or the Brits or the Americans. Um, we do it primarily with the Dutch. And that's basically, from my understanding, to get the Dutch into Afghanistan and to get Australia into NATO. That mission's accomplished fairly early on. But then that reconstruction task force goes on for quite some time. We bring in helicopters, Chanel helicopters to help out for a while. Um, special forces continue to operate throughout this period, conducting what they call direct action, trying to target the Taliban leadership in Aruzgan to neutralise them, so they say neutralise, to enable the reconstruction work to go ahead, to enable the winning of the so-called hearts and minds, the WHAM approach of what they call counterinsurgency or COIN, um, which Australians have tended to be proud of, having a, a degree of confidence in their ability to do this, even though historically we've done it, we've only done it in patches and have had a, a, a niche uh, approach to COIN, haven't had a holistic approach.
So we do that for a while, reconstructing. Then we realize we need to do a bit of mentoring as well. So we shift the emphasis from men a reconstruction to mentoring and reconstruction um, for a couple of years. And then eventually we drop the reconstruction bit and we focus purely on mentoring. And we do that because we realize we need to transition out. We're at the point where we've virtually done all we can. And this is effectively what I would say uh, Prime Minister Julia Gillard said not that long ago here in Canberra to an Aspie uh, lunch where she basically acknowledged that uh, we're moving out, but we're doing moving out on, on, the, on military advice as well. The, the sense was that we've done all we can. Now, I've done a lot of the talking so far. <laughs> we've got two experts here, and I'd like to just get their sense on what they make of Australia's contribution uh, in Aruzgan and in Afghanistan broadly. Um, yeah, no, I think, I think the Australian... Uh, commitment to Afghanistan has gone through many different phases as many of the coalitions have. Uh, I think overall one of the key things that Australia has provided is the staff officers and headquarters. I mean you see them functioning in most headquarters from COM ISAF's level all the way down mm -hmm. to RC South. Uh, the Special Forces of course have done stellar work not just in Norris Gun as we know but they've also supported missions in, in Helmand and in Kandahar provinces. Um, and I think there was a little bit of confusion about the um, reconstruction teams and the omelet teams that came in later and especially as RC South became the focus of effort in 2009 and I think there were there were definitely debates going on about potential op you know when we move a Kandak an Afghan National Army Kandak from Oregon to Helmand province for op Mastarak mm. can the Australian training team come with them mm. And um, I'll just preview to say that, yeah, there are lots of conversations going on about th that movement. But as you mentioned in your opening talk, there is that issue of the casualty mm. problem. But it's not just Australia. There, there are plenty mm. of other countries that, that have had that issue in Afghanistan. Mm. Um, but I do think working with the Australian military, both in Afghanistan as well as working with them here, I do think that there, was, there were some members within the ADF who wished that they could have done a little bit more. Um, not just in Oriskan, but in some other places. But that was a political decision mm, made, right? But Paul. Yeah, thank you. Before I, I respond, I'd like to say, just for the record, my opinions are my own. They're not necessarily reflective of the Department of the Army, the um, federal government, mm -hmm. and certainly not the Department of Defense. I'd also like to caveat my response by saying that all too often in the United States, not necessarily policymakers or those of us in the military, but maybe the general public, we have a tendency to eschew or ignore just the sacrifice and commitment that the Australian digger has made to Afghanistan. I want to say on behalf of the United States, uh, serving as an ambassador out here to your country, thank you very much for the commitment that Australia has made to the mission for a decade at this point. As I look at Australia's commitment to Afghanistan, there's really three broad areas that I can speak to. The first is that having been privy to the Australian and American leadership dialogue and what that means, Australia's role in Afghanistan certainly redounds upon just how important the security alliance is with the United States. And this is something, if we contextualize it against the rise of China and the Asian Pacific century, is going to become more important mm -hmm. in the very near future. Second, if we define the mission in Afghanistan at this point as disrupting the Taliban, as denying sanctuary to al-Qaeda and other associated international terrorists and insulating the burgeoning Afghan government, then I think actually Australia has provided a capability mm -hmm. beyond just mentorship of the 4th ANA Brigade that we need to identify force protection or has gone via counter IED work, mm -hmm. counter mortar counter uh, artillery and certainly the soft capability that buttresses the population centric coin strategy in the south in particular. Mm -hmm. And then more broadly we, we can't forget that Afghanistan is in Central Asia. It's in West Asia. And as we look at most important regions in this world, there has seemed to be uh, been a uh, transpiring of a regional global nexus based upon the rise of China, based upon foreign direct investment in uh, the Asian Pacific in particular, which means that events that happen in this region actually impinge importantly on global order. Mm -hmm. And so I think by a presence in Afghanistan and helping the mission, we actually help Australia um, in, in its building of order and security within the Asian Pacific region. Mm. Well, a related issue is whether or not the mission can be deemed a success. And there's been a lot of talk about uh, this being uh, a, a, a disaster. Uh, there's, there's, there's people using uh, extreme mm -hmm. language to yeah. describe mm -hmm. uh, the situation in Afghanistan as diabolical. Mm -hmm. um, Daniel, I wonder if you want to comment. I think part of the problem is, is this issue of success in mm -hmm. terms of the way that the narrative has been shifting for the last 11 years, um, you know, from the mission, mission statements to where we are now. Um, I, the reality, and again, this is 
just a historian's point of view, working on the ground and seeing the changes, in theory there is progress being made, but progress in the eyes of the local community. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily would be seen as success in Canberra or D.C. by the, the common individual, but in terms of stability, it might be local stability and other things, that is occurring. Uh, but this idea that I think, that, and sadly there are mistakes made even by our senior command at times, talking about the future of Afghanistan will look like X, mm. that reality was never there. Mm. And um, so I think we have to be careful about, as of 2012, to say, yeah. you know, can we deem it success or unsuccessful? I don't think we're going to be able to say that until 2015, 2016. And then by that, that point, as we've seen in the last three or four years in Afghanistan, the reality of what I, what I say is Afghan reality, not Afghan good enough, but Afghan reality, mm. it will be set in stone in, in, in a much better way. Mm. And, and you do see that in, in the heartland of the, of the posthume belt with RC Southwest and South. Mm. There's a lot of things that have happened in the last two and a half years that nobody could have forecasted two and a half years ago that is actually there's progress. But it's not progress in the sense of what you opened with in the sense that if you're talking a top-down governance coming down from Kabul, that's not what it looks like. But that's also not Afghan reality. Mm. And so it, we are, we in terms of the, the political masters in both DC, Canberra, Ottawa, and London, have sadly been partially guilty of that by not defining the reality of what it should look like, you know, through the prism of Afghan history and mm. tradition. Mm. Um, and then conveying that to the American people, the Australian people, mm. and everybody else. Mm. So. Mm. Yeah, I would say that he made a very good comment uh, in terms of how we define success. And from my perspective on the ground, also stepping back a bit these last couple of years and analyzing the situation from a distance is to identify two schools of thought on what success means. If we mean success in terms of building a capable and legitimate state that was identified at the Bonn Conference in 2001, I'd have to say probably not been successful in this path. And I mm -hmm. think you can point to several indicators, the lack of transparency in the government. We were talking about HR General HR McMaster and yeah. the task force that he spearheads to yeah. bring transparency. Yeah. The fact that you now have tribal leaders in particular who are moving more towards the Taliban, the Afghan Taliban based in Balochistan in a North Waziristan because they provide a sense of public goods in terms of security and justice. And no matter how anachronistic it may be for us, it mm. certainly helps them feel a sense of ambient security. Mm. And on the other hand, you have, if we define it again in terms of disrupting the Taliban, denying sanctuary al-Qaeda and others, mm. and insulating the Afghan government, then I think we've been cautiously or, or, or marginally successful here on the basis of our special forces in high value targeting. Mm. And that's my pedigree within the military with the 75th Ranger Regiment, and I've written a couple articles on this. Mm. So I think we've been successful there. But this debate in itself is part and parcel to a larger debate mm -hmm. that crosses Afghanistan and Iraq, and that's the success or lack thereof of coin. Mm. And no one, as you said earlier, can actually tout themselves as an expert on coin, but certainly we have absolutely counterinsurgency. Yeah. We have people sitting among us right now who can talk to it. And I'd be interested in your thoughts potentially on how the counterinsurgency campaign and strategy has fared in Afghanistan. Yeah, well, that's an interesting one because, you know, Australians uh, pride themselves in having a, a sense of coin, of being good at counterinsurgency. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've got tickets on ourselves that way. I've, I've written on the topic myself. Lots of Australians like to think we, we, it's our it's our it's our comfort zone. Yeah. And arguably, you know, it's, it's in my military life, uh, a lot of the uh, the training I went as a young officer uh, and even before as a cadet was very much focused on the Vietnam War experience and mm -hmm. training for using tactics and procedures that were very much like had been used in the Vietnam yeah. War era. And and the sense was, although the term counterinsurgency or coin wasn't in popular usage so much in those days. Um, the, the concepts were, were the, that, are, that are espoused as being the, the concepts of coin mm -hmm. were ones that Australian soldiers and officers tended to be familiar and comfortable with. Mm -hmm. So there was a sense that this was our, our comfort zone. But Australia has actually never really holistically approached the topic uh, and sought to grapple the full spectrum of what it actually means to do counterinsurgency. Yeah. It, it's something we've, we've always made a niche contribution to mm -hmm. and left other allies to, to fill in the gaps, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly that was experience in Vietnam where we contributed a substantial force for mm -hmm. Australia. It was big. Um, but even then, we, 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 we were relying on Americans mm -hmm. to provide some of the key enabling support elements to make uh, the operations work properly in what was then Phuc Thuy province in mm -hmm. South Vietnam. Yeah. Similarly, in Aruzgan, um, mm -hmm. we, 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 we felt we were good at this stuff, but we were very heavily reliant mm -hmm. on a lot of help from great friends and partners, mm -hmm. uh, including the Dutch and the United States and others who were in the area. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
you know, it, it is something that uh, Australians need to be careful about getting too cocky about mm. because it's something that uh, that we're not necessarily all that good at. And also, uh, counterinsurgency, and I think you were touching on this before, Dan, offline, uh, counterinsurgency is more than just uh, trying to win the hearts and minds of oh, people. Yeah. Right. Mm. This is actually a very complicated uh, spectrum of, mm. of, of operations. That includes serious fighting. Yes, mm. um, right. And, and, and to be fair, Australia recognises that. The Australian Army recognises right. that. The Australian Defence Force understands that. And to a certain extent, that's why we went in heavy with the Special Forces. Mm -hmm. right. These guys are incredibly professional. They know what they're doing. They're, they're, they're very thorough in their picking of targets. This is, this is a not an indiscriminate use of force. It's a very discriminating agency for a very specific purpose mm. um, and uh, uh, you know the, the special forces and the the, uh, the task forces the mentoring and reconstruction task forces mm. sought to capitalize as, as well as possible on all the sources of information available to them mm -hmm. to make sure that whatever they did was very carefully calibrated to make sure that they they only did what was necessary and didn't generate what's commonly called collateral damage yeah um, so but it's it's very complicated and, and Dan I know you, you know the counterinsurgency de debate is is, well, uh, is a hot one. But yeah, I mean it's a hot one in the sense. I mean, as, again, as a historian, one of the, the problems we're having is that when you look at the narrative of counterinsurgency, sometimes people have only cherry picked mm. various case studies for specific arguments at the time, mm. and even the term population centric. There's no centric anything, ironically, mm. in these campaigns. Mm. You know, enemy centric or pop centric. Mm. Um, and one of the biggest problems we have is is that when we look at sort of the other side, you know, the non-government agencies and, 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 and you know, the, the State Department, DFAT, you know, FCO and things like that. If you look at previous campaigns, it was mostly the host nation trying to develop those systems mm. and just pouring money at it, just getting in 1,500 civilians, looking through the prism of, of D.C. or Canberra doesn't work. And if mm. you look at the successful counterinsurgency campaigns in the past, the irony is, is that it's a local solution. Mm. And it's mm. their solution. Mm. It's not the the Brit solution. It's not mm. necessarily even Dofar. Mm. Look at Dofar. Look at Malay. Look at all these other things. Mm -hmm. And we have to be really careful coming back to that original question of success, mm. because at the end of the day, my view of success is we'll probably see a federated sort of state within Afghanistan, mm. where the ethnic, especially the Pashtuns, will have to feel that they have a say in that government in Kabul. But actually, that power will be actually devolved down to that mm. level of the provinces and things like that. Now, we as Americans, we forget that that's how we developed. Mm. The Canadians are still sort of at that stage with their provinces and the power with Ottawa. Mm. Britain is a highly centralized state. It's different. So even within the so-called Western alliance, mm -hmm. we have different views of how government works and how it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, living in Missouri for the last two and a half years, they don't care what happens in <laughs> D.C. They only care what happens in Jefferson City. So, you know, and, and we forget that when we're working out there mm -hmm. sometimes, especially a lot of our own officials and even our military commanders forget that this is not an American solution. This is not a Western solution. This mm -hmm. is their solution, mm -hmm. just like it is back home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that reality is setting in quite well, and I've seen that work from the, you know, the, well, you could say that at least the ISAF level down. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, and but it's been lost sometimes at, at the debates back home. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, that's kind of it, it's more complicated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If I can add a couple things, it's been interesting to note that we talked about the enemy centric or population centric mm -hmm. coin approach or counterinsurgency approach, and I think this is just it is that we've been meandering. Uh, so to speak, between which one of those is actually very important. And right now you get kind of a hybrid approach whereby we want to support the population and help build the social political institutions to have a stable state mm -hmm. um, in our withdrawal, but at the same time we're also killing those irreconcilables. That's not to say it's a bad thing, but also it builds confusion and mistrust on the part of potentially some moderate Taliban who would otherwise uh, adhere to a negotiating framework. But mm -hmm. more from my standpoint as a junior military officer right now, the debate about coin is something we have to confront because at mm -hmm. this point in the States, there are two narratives that I think we can identify. One is that coin is dead <laughs> and coin never actually lived. And one of the flag bearers of this school of thought would be General, or excuse me, Colonel Gentile, we talked about earlier, sir, from uh, West Point, United States Military Academy at West Point. Mm. Uh, another, uh, on the other side of that would be uh, John Noggle uh, mm. and his ilk who talk about COIN alive and well. In fact, COIN prevents the strategic and doctrinal framework through which the U.S. military and army in particular should operate in an era of persistent conflict. Mm. And I see at this point a lot of people, and there was a, a, um, a conference at the University of Texas in Austin, who have engaged in this inductive reasoning from a case of studies such as Malaya, and if we've actually learned the, the right lessons. And one thing I'll just mention is, we have uh, this ability to overstate or excuse me, understate what took place in Iraq, um, whereby 
we think that maybe a coin success punitively led to a potential success in Afghanistan. I think we have to be a little bit more balanced on how we interrogate the situation. It potentially was more of a confluence of a couple things. One was the surge mm. as well as the Sunni awakening. Mm. And maybe you couldn't have one without the other. So we have direct to put it in better. Too. Mm. Direct action too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right, right. HVT. So we have to put this in better context, I think. Yeah. I think though, as an Australian looking at the U.S. Army, um, particularly as someone who was formerly in the, in the Australian Army, and our, the sense in the Australian Army, I would argue, and in, in Australia more broadly, was that the United States had... Uh, after the Vietnam War, reverted to a comfort zone of fighting in the Fulda Gap, mm. in the German plane with tanks and aircraft. Uh, and and then the first phase of the Iraq War was that, and that was great, uh, but that the follow-on bits left, you know, we just weren't adequately addressed. Mm. Uh, and it was that that arguably you know, led to the conflagration that mm -hmm. became Iraq 2003 to mm. today. Mm -hmm. um, uh, had that uh, had a had a coin mindset, a counterinsurgency mindset, been adopted from the outset, then perhaps we could have nipped things in the bud, handled things differently, managed the fallout much better, uh, and uh, certainly the, the sense in you know talking to other people in the Australian military is that um, the coin is a no-brainer, even though we have a you know incomplete view of it. It's 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 of it's of course what you have to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, there are there are, there are other bits to, to do as well, but to say it's about coin or it's not about coin, it, it seems to be a, a false dichotomy. Absolutely, uh, it's uh, well, one of the key things I think, and this is where even two thousand three, the march to Baghdad, we had our bad moments too, mm -hmm. even in the so called conventional side, um, and I think people, this is you know something that's been happening in the professional military education mm -hmm. side in both the UK as well as the US. There's been a lack of professional education in the art of war, you might say, mm. or the, the profession of arms. And so if we are training our officers, NCOs, and others, I'm not sorry, not training, educating our, our people the correct way, they'll be able to understand war overall. And then mm. they'll understand what kind of war they're in as such. Mm. And then apply those mindsets and critical thinking to those ele you know, elements of the fight that they need to deal with. Mm -hmm. okay. and because, no. it, because even on the road to Baghdad, Commanders were recognizing this This was a little bit different, and certain units were actually reforming even on the way up. And General Mattis was a great example of yeah. that mm -hmm. with, with the Marines. Mm. Uh, and he was pulling in people to say, right, this is a little bit different than we expected. Yeah. But his, his, his comments and others' comments after the fact was we were not in the correct mindset to understand that this is the spectrum of conflict. Okay. And so this coin debate, mm. MCO debate, and that kind of thing, it's understand the full spectrum. Now we're running out of time, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so we, we do need to. We've got a couple mm -hmm. other questions I wanted to touch on. One, one, one of the things is we touched on, touched on it before briefly, and that's the, the issue about the, whether the local for, uh, indigenous forces mm -hmm. are likely to be able to, to guarantee security mm -hmm. and peace once the drawdown occurs. And where is Afghanistan going? What does the future hold? Yeah. Well, one of the key things. I mean, the, this has been a debate for a number of years, but. We focused on the Afghan National Army for a variety of reasons. One, we defaulted thinking the army was the way forward. And two, we wanted to instill this sort of Afghan national identity mm. as such. Mm. Well, finally, after a number of years, we've recognized that the predominant groups were Uzbek and Tajiks for the officer corps and things like that. And there was a disconnect in the posthume belt. But what has happened in the last uh, probably two years is this idea of the AMP being locally recruited, not ALP, which was mm -hmm. an SF mission, but the AMP being locally recruited. And what yeah, I have, national police. Afghan yeah. National Police, not being sent down from Kunduz to go to Helmand or something like that. Mm. And there has been a lot of work with MOI, the, the Afghan Ministry, Ministry of Interior. Interior. I apologize, mm. acronyms. Um, <laughs> Cut from the U.S. Army. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the key thing is, is that we actually are seeing, and Helmand is going to be the big case study, I think, in the next nine months. Mm. As the Marines are pulling back, mm. the Brits are still keeping their, their forces there as such. But as we see in certain districts where we have seen, and I have seen it personally, mm. very good AMP leading the protection of the, the local security forces, we've seen the ANA pull out of those areas mm. and pull back because ethnically a lot of them aren't even Pashtun or yeah. even from the area. Mm. So we have seen some progress, and this is true in Kandahar province. So the, the, the center of the insurgency only two years ago, you do see very good progress in places like the Aghanam district, Gamsia district, um, Nauzad even, and other places, even mm. in Maja now. 
Um, and so we have to be careful, again, though, of assessing and saying that that is mm -hmm. working there, then it can happen in RC East. Absolutely. And that is what's happening at the higher level, which mm -hmm. is important. That commanders in RC East and South and Southwest are learning from each other, but they're not trying to cherry pick to drop mm -hmm. on. Okay. And there's 60 different solutions everywhere. Yeah, I, I, I would say I definitely agree with a lot of his assessment. A couple things here is we have to really kind of start to uh, build on statistics for measurements. Again, quantitative analysis is huge in the military. I mean, we got right now the ANSF, the Army in particular, participating 90% of the operation. Mm -hmm. leading 40%, taking twice as many casualties. They're at the mark of uh, 352,000 troops at this point. Mm -hmm. So that's very important, and it's a testament to the work of people like General Caldwell, who built NATO training munition in Afghanistan, which has become more important as we promote the exit in itself as our strategy mm -hmm. at this point. Mm -hmm. However, I'm a bit concerned uh, for a couple of different reasons. One, you've mentioned the ethnic nature of the officer corps not being Pashtun representative. Uh, also, we have a lot of illiteracy, which I think begs questions on the continued recruitment and leadership within the Army. Mm -hmm. The military, the Army is uh, under-resourced, particularly in terms of logistics. When I was providing mm -hmm. security in 2010 for the elections, what I saw was a lifting and shifting uh, of helicopters in particular to fair around UN electoral monitors as well as different equipment and ballots. And the final thing I'd mention is that the questions at United States Army Ranger School in particular are, do you want this person to your left or right serving in your military, your army? And the second more important one is, do you want them serving in your foxhole? Yeah. And I just don't, I'm not sure at this point that the ANA has the cohesive identity and mutual trust uh, to provide for long-term peace and stability. Uh, and that would just be one of the things I think is, is important to identify. So we look like... Uh, possibly muddling through? It's not a bad thing. No. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a bad thing at all. Um, and there are things actually that can build a sense of identity. Um, mm -hmm. Local survey work shows that a majority of the Afghan in the military, whether or not they're ethnic uh, Pashtuns or not, identify Pakistan as the enemy. Mm -hmm. And they also identify uh, Islam as a codifying uh, agent in terms of religion. Now, the question that comes after that is, how do you as NATO, and NT, uh, uh, the National Training Mission uh, NATO, actually capitalize on that yeah. without creating uh, worse relations with Pakistan. Can I just jump in yeah. just to follow on from, yeah. from the captain? One key thing, thing, though, is that we are still looking through the prism of our own armies, mm -hmm. sometimes when we're assessing ANA or AMP and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, this is a force that needs to do at least internal security in its own state. Mm -hmm. and, and they will probably be able to provide that at different levels as long as the power arrangements are set up above mm -hmm. us. But part of the problem sometimes when we're assessing you know, our NTMA standards mm -hmm. and things like that. We're looking through the prism of Fort Benning. We're looking through the prism of, you know, uh, Warminster and other mm -hmm. places in the UK. Mm -hmm. And to sort of, even even though the politicians sometimes have had a t difficult time shifting their own Western mindsets, even our own forces have to do that. And a yeah. lot of commanders have rec recognized, even within the Special Forces, that this works for this area. Yeah. Yeah. But would I necessarily want him in a foxhole against the Soviet, uh, Russians? Probably not, but... <laughs> one, yeah. one final issue I wanted to... Um, touch on briefly and if I can get you in, in sort of give me a one minute snapshot on this. What do you think are the grand strategic issues at stake at this war and why are we there? Well I think in the future the key thing is this issue of strategic death for Pakistan and the way that they view the relationship that Kabul has with India and this has been going on for a long time but I think it's only in the last three or four years that we as America have started to say wait a minute where do we fit into this? Where does Australia fit into this relationship with India and Pakistan? China, of course, is playing a role in its own way. But this truly does fit in with that issue between Pakistan and India. And although there are people in the Pakistan military, of course, who see Indians everywhere on the other side of the border, mm. Um, mm. some people, even the Indians, would say that mm, maybe there's a way we can actually draw down some of our presence to relieve some of the pressure here. But it is going to have an impact uh, all the way across Central Asia as such, if India mm -hmm. and Pakistan cannot resolve what Afghanistan means to them. Mm -hmm. um, less so the issues with, you know, Uzbekistan and places like that. But mm -hmm. India and Pakistan's relationship about Afghanistan needs to be worked out. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would identify three things. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is that I think in terms of terrorism, certainly very important to be in Afghanistan to stem the type of things that took place before 9-11 in terms of sanctuary. We have to also be considered about not promulgating insensitively this terrorism narrative and conflating mm. the waning capabilities of AQ mm. with right. our premise inter pares or first among other yep. security threats. Mm. The second thing is, again, if we consider Afghanistan's in Central Asia and the regional global nexus, which is transpiring before us, and it's important that we're there to stem this type of threats, vulnerabilities that could transpire from uh, Afghanistan, whether that's decent ransomed people or refugees mm. or even the sanctuary uh, that Afghanistan could become. And finally, I think that particularly for America, 
that the mission in Afghanistan uh, begs serious questions on status and standing and legitimacy. So I think it's important that we see the mission through and mm -hmm. achieve any sort of success in how we define that mm -hmm. in order to build the type of legitimacy that is required to operate effectively in the Asian Pacific in particular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's some yeah. issues there, aren't there? Yeah. And certainly, uh, you know, from Australia's point of view, my sense is that, uh, you know, obviously our alliance commitment with the United States is, is, is important, but it's not the only factor. Mm -hmm. uh, there's other factors here as well, and one of which is the, is the potential spread of terrorism, um, the, the, the issue of people smuggling. There's also a matter of consistency and following through on yeah. what you say you're going to do, and I think you touched on that. Point. In the end of the day, it's for the Afghans, I yeah. mean, really. We have a, I would identify a moral duty to provide a better existence. Well, that's an interesting point. But there's another dimension, too, which we haven't quite touched on, which I think might be one, and it's one that the government, the Australian government, is not really wanting to talk about. And this is the question of the potential balkanisation of Pakistan. Mm. Um, and uh, it, it, it's important, I, I would argue, that uh, that whatever happens in Afghanistan isn't allowed to just go to completely to seed. Um, because uh, the knock-on consequences for uh, Pakistan, which is... Most of the, a large portion of the Pashtun comp population is living in Pakistan. This is a country with lots of uh, uh, hot spots, uh, lots of uh, the areas that could potentially break away. Uh, it's got uh, it's a nuclear armed state. It's uh, it's got dimensions that are worrying to many others around. That uh, you know make it uh, make it significant. Australia's engaged there. We've got a defence cooperation program. Mm. We've got about 140 people on that defence cooperation program at the moment. Uh, uh, on an annual basis. So Australia is invested. It's invested in Afghanistan. It's invested in Pakistan. Um, and all, uh, we can only hope that they manage to muddle through mm. uh, and, uh, and hold it together. Um, but I think the point you made, Daniel, is an interesting one about a decentralised future. Yeah. Uh, we've had a national model uh, and certainly it does look like there's, uh, there's uh, going to be a more decentralized future. I, can, I would, can I just mention one thing yeah. real quick? I don't think we can understate the gravity of what Afghanistan is. If I uh, look at some of the research I've done out here and talk to some professors such as William Maley, there yeah. is a potential for Afghanistan to spiral into civil war. Mm. I hate to overstate that, and it's a serious issue. That's why it's very, very important that we're very sensitive to what works in terms of building a capable army to provide security when we leave, NATO that, leaves. In that's good, Paul, because the final point I would make is that, uh, you know, this is a country that's made up a lot of... Uh, ethnic groups, and you touched on this, Dan, it's the Pashtus, the Hazaris, the Uzbeks, uh, you know, there's a lot of different groups, a lot of languages. Uh, this is not a monolithic state. And I would make a point, uh, in pe some people, and I've made the comparison too, with Vietnam, mm -hmm. but th the ending of the Vietnam War was a dramatic one where the North invaded, I remember watching it on TV as a kid, very moving, graphic, dramatic stuff. My sense is, and I'd be interested in just your two bobs worth for, mm. for a second, is my sense is that that's not likely to happen in, no. in Afghanistan, partly because the, the Taliban aren't a united group. There's all sorts of factions and mm -hmm. rivalries that we saw after the, the Mujahideen finished up. They all broke up. My sense is that that's kind of similar future we're likely to see in terms of the splitting up of, of groups that are holding together for now that probably would diffuse afterwards. Well, the key thing is, is that, and again, when people have this analogy with Vietnam, it's a completely different campaign again. People yeah. have to understand that. There weren't 10 MVA divisions sitting in Pakistan ready to invade Kandahar. Yeah. There's a completely different dimension to that war. Mm. And the, the flip side to that is, though, we have to remember that, sadly, at the end of the day, we abandoned South Vietnam. Mm. Mm. Yeah. We can't abandon, we're not going to abandon the Iraqi government, we can't abandon whatever government Afghanistan may look like in the future. Well, partly for our own narrative, but also for absolutely. the way we are seeing the rest of the world. Yeah. We as Americans. Are Daniel Marston, right. Paul Lushenko, we've run out of time, but thank you very much uh, for your in, uh, engaging with us on this topic. Thank you.